Hey guys, today I wanted to share with you a really cool modern classical guitar piece, which is actually a great piece to learn no matter what level you are. So if you're kind of mastered some of the easier pieces, which we've done on this channel, the waltz, the carousel, those kinds of things, you could think about moving on to this, even though you can also play it as quite an advanced performance piece. It uses a lot of open strings. It's got the sixth string tuned to F, and it's written using quite a simple set of ingredients. I mean, a simple scale, simple, simple few left hand positions, and a repetitive right hand pattern, a few little right hand patterns. So what's great about that is you can take the ingredients and use them to improvise, create your own version. You could take a section of the piece and learn it as a kind of a study, or you could learn the piece, if you like, exactly as it's composed and play the whole thing in a concert. A very beautiful, imaginative piece. It's called Kinkachu, I Love You. And if you look at the original score, the original score is written by hand. You can't find a, you can't find a printed out, like, I guess, formatted version anywhere. It's just the original facsimile written by Philip Houghton. And there's lots of in-depth performance instructions. And I suggest you all get a copy of that score. It's, it's really cool and you can you can read about the whole story behind the piece but basically it's about a bird a mythical bird which as it says at the beginning of the piece is wounded in the spirit realm and flies into this world and many of the melody notes come on the off beats and it gives this kind of feeling of like flapping wings and flying it's kind of lightness so really unusual piece and yeah, a great, a great piece to learn from an educational point of view, from a technique point of view, and also a really fun piece, I think, to perform and to use, you know, you might, great to play underneath, you know, if someone's reciting poetry or, it, it can be used in lots of different ways and also used as a basis for your own improvisation and composing. So I've had a lot of fun with this piece with a lot of students and I hope that, I hope you enjoy. If you want to see more guitar videos like this, please consider subscribing to the channel if you haven't subscribed already. And if you like the video, please don't be shy, hit that like and ring the bell so you get notifications. We do all things, all things guitar and we'd love to have you with us on this journey. So enjoy and I'll see you in the lesson. When we look at a big piece like this, a long piece, the first thing I always suggest is to have an idea of the architecture, have an idea of the different sections so that we can put everything that we learn into a context. Normally as guitarists, we do exactly the opposite. We just dive in straight into the detail and never look at the bigger picture. And what ends up happening is it ends up taking much longer to learn the piece because we end up learning the same thing twice in two different places and never really relating all of the information. To, to a larger structure, to a context. So I think whatever you learn, especially with these big constructions, it's very good to start by placing everything in context. So this particular piece, I would say it has five, five sections and I've, I call them A, B, C, D, and E. And A comes three times, the B section comes twice, C comes twice, and then D comes just before the end, and E for ending is the ending, which is very, very simple. So if we look at the form of the whole piece, it's A and then B, and then A again, and then C, and then A again, and then a modified version of C, just one note different, and then it has B again, and it's a slightly modified version of B, then we have the D section, which is kind of like a winding down section. The climax of the piece is almost there in the second B, so the, the variation of B. And then we have the D section, which is kind of like a winding down. And then we have the E, which is the, the ending part. So let's learn it section by section. So we start with the A section. Now, throughout the piece, there are two right-hand patterns 
which we see being used again and again. And I'm just going to call them right hand one and right hand two. So right hand one is thumb index, thumb index. And it can fall over different strings, but in the A section, it's on the sixth, the third and the fourth string. It sounds like this. Thumb index, thumb index. Then right hand two is very similar, except the first note is a high note. So in this case, it's the high E. And it's gonna be ring finger playing on the high E. And the next three notes are the same as right hand one. Index, thumb, index. So when we put the two together, right hand one and right hand two, it looks like this. And the A section, which comes three times and which is always exactly the same, uses only that pattern in the right hand, except in the second half in the, in the sixth bar. It uses right hand one twice in a row. So instead of having eight notes in a bar like this, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, it goes one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So the next thing, if we if we want to learn the section, what I suggest, what we'll do is we'll learn the right hand first. So we've got the right hand, and then we'll have a look at what are the notes that are used. Now this piece is written in F major, the low string is tuned up to F. So there's a few ways you can do that. You could play the fourth fret if you're using like the free version of guitar tuner, and which only is only only will tell you the, the, the strings of the normal standard tuning guitar. So if you play the fourth fret and tune that note so that the tuner thinks you're tuning the open A string, that's one way of tuning to F. If you want to do it by ear, say you were down in E, you could play fret 3 on the D string and then play the artificial harmonic on the 6th string and then tune up like that so that those two notes are in tune. And then you have the two Fs like that. So if we think about the A section, we've got the right hand pattern, which is all centering around that index finger. It's an eight bar long section, and it's just that sixth bar where we have the first half of the pattern twice. So we have right hand one twice. And that's because the melody moves in that bar. So maybe to make it simpler, hand pattern becomes a little bit simpler. So if we want to think of it very simply, we could think of just the melody notes as a sequence and of numbers. Five, seven, two, four, five, seven, ten, fourteen, fourteen. And then if we put the two hands together, we're going to use finger one for all the melody notes except for that fourteen at the end. We're going to use a gentle vibrato on all the notes that's written in the score and also a gentle portimento, a slide between the notes. So it'll sound like this. section and it's going to come three times three times in the first it's kind of in the first 75 percent 70 percent of the piece that section gets repeated three times let's have a look at the b section so the b section is eight bars long and i like to think of it as b1 the first four bars b2 the next four bars and that's because of a change which is coming later so the whole b section eight bars B1, the first four, B2, the next four. So if we look at the ingredients of B1, we move back to second position, and it uses the same right hand one, except it's on lower strings. So it's going to be thumb index, thumb index on the low three strings. And then it uses right hand two with different high notes. 
So to start with, again, a lower version. And later on, it's going to also use the ring finger on the B string to play a higher melody note. The way this part of the song is written, the melody notes are the high notes. So in section A, the melody notes were the, the middle notes, the notes on the G string. That's where the melody was. In the B section, the melody notes are the high notes, the notes on the third beat of each bar. So what we're going to do is we're going to hold this chord, C and A, and the melody note is going to be this A over here on the third beat of the bar. So it's one and two and three and four. And, and what is written in the score is a rest stroke for that note. Now, you could do a rest stroke and it'll, it'll block out the open D string. That's okay. Actually, later in the piece, in when the B section comes again, it's written into the score to do the rest strokes regardless. But as it's not written in here, I think it's up to us whether we want to use the rest stroke and get that little bit more power, or if you want to just use a stronger free stroke and bring out the melody that way. So we're holding down this shape. This is the first bar of B1. It's going to be thumb index, thumb index, right hand one, middle index, thumb index, with an accent on the middle. next bar is exactly the same except for that note on the third beat. So you'll notice I'm playing eight notes, but I'm talking about the third beat. That's because we're playing eighth notes. So if I count it, it's going to be one and two and three and four and. So it's that high note on the third beat, which is the melody note, which is what's going to sing out and what's going to join to the next melody or tune note. The next bar is very similar, except we're going to use the ring finger on the third beat. And we're going to play the open B string. The only difference. And here, rest stroke works really nicely. The third bar is again the same pattern, except here we're going to play the open G string on that third beat. So it's going to sound like this. So when we put all three bars together, what we hear is this melody. Very simple melody, but it sounds beautiful intertwined with all this string crossing. Then the fourth bar of B1 is also the, the same as the fourth bar of B2. And it's a unique bar, it doesn't have any regular pattern. We play with the thumb, the, the F open string, the fret three on string five. Then we, so it's the first time we have two thumb notes in a row. Then we have the index finger on the D string. And then we're gonna play the eighth fret with the baby finger on string five. So that's the first half of the bar. And the idea is to let the D string ring so that everything is ringing as much as possible. In the second half of the bar, we go to fret seven on the D string, fret five on the, on the G string, and then we play the open B and then the open G. So the index, middle, and ring finger are gonna stay stuck on the fourth, third, and second string, respectively but the thumb is going to play anything that comes on the low two strings. In fact, for the entire B section, B1 and B2, this is the policy of the right hand. The index finger plays on the D, any note on the D, and it only plays on the D. The middle finger plays on the G string, any note in the G string, and it only plays that string. The ring finger handles the two higher strings, and the thumb handles the two lower strings. And it's exactly the same in bar four. Thumb, thumb, index, thumb, then index, middle, ring, then we have to lift off finger one, and we play the middle finger again. And in the score, there's quite an elaborate note written about 
not holding down the F, but holding down the A, holding down fret seven on the fourth string, so that that's the note that's really gonna stick out in that bar. Something like that, and it makes me think that perhaps that's like the fourth melody note in the tune. So if I play it quite fast and try to bring the melody really to the surface, it would sound like this. And that's an interpretational thing. But regardless of whether you see that as a melody note or just an important note in the score for some reason, we, do, we are told, we're asked not, not to play that F, not to hold that F, sorry, but to hold this A, which is fret seven of the D string, which is again on the third beat of that bar. So those are the first four bars of B, what I call B1. Then we have B2, which is a slightly more advanced version of B. Again, we're gonna start with this chord. And again, the melody note is the A at the top. So the first bar of B2 is exactly the same as B1. Then we have some more moving melody parts. So the right hand gets a bit more interesting. We're gonna play with the ring finger on the high strings and the index finger is gonna stay on the D string. Remember in B1 and B2, the index finger always plays the D string and it doesn't play any other string. Bar two starts the same way, but then the second half we have the ring, and then the open D string, and then the ring finger again, playing the third fret on the B string. So that's a new right hand pattern. Ring, index, ring, index, which we haven't seen before. So that the melody can move. Now we have melodies on the melody notes every quarter note. And then we have for the first time in the whole piece two notes at the same time. And we have again right hand pattern one. What's well, actually right hand pattern one and right hand pattern two at the same time because we play the low note and the high note together. And then index, thumb index. And then once again right hand pattern two with an open G string. So if I play that quite fast, bringing out the melody, and I'll say the names of the melody notes, it's A, E, D, B, G. And bar eight of B, the last bar of B2, is exactly the same as the last bar of B1. So the fourth bar and the eighth bar of the grand B are the same. After the first, the first B, so we have A, then we have the B section, B1 and B2, then we have a repeat of A, and it's exactly the same as it was before, same dynamic and everything. So it's piano, just as the first A was, exactly the same, exactly the same pattern. After that A, we move to C, and C, just like B, I like to think of as C1, and C2. That helps us later on when certain little things change. So C is the highest part of the song. The A section is kind of in the middle, the B section is low, the C section is high. And for a lot of C, we have the melody, well for all of C1, we have the melody on the second string. The right hand pattern stays the same, we've got right hand one and right hand two, except now we don't use the ring finger because we've got the index finger playing on the B string, so we're gonna use the middle finger to play on the E string. So the general rule of this hand is we use adjacent fingers for adjacent strings. Of course, in B2, that doesn't happen. And that's quite an, that's quite an exception to stretch so far from the ring to the index, but there's a different system being followed there. So in the C section, we're gonna use the index finger on the B string, the middle finger on the E string. Apart from that, the pattern stays the same. So thumb, index, thumb, index, middle index, thumb, index. The thumb plays between the low F, the sixth string, and the D string. Now the frets are gonna be 13, 
12, 8, 10. And C1, the first half of C, is actually a five bar pattern. It's unusual to have an odd number. We're going to start with fret 13, then 12, then 8, and then we've got fret 10 for two bars. So fret 10 twice. Sounds like this. As well as that, there's one small variation towards the end when we hit that 10th fret. Instead of playing the last D as usual, as an open string, we're going to be playing it as a harmonic, a 12th fret harmonic. So it sounds like this. So if we want to just very quickly summarize C1, this is the pattern for the right hand, right hand one, right hand two, using string one, two, four, and six, with the index in the middle finger, and the frets are going to be 13, 12, 8, 10, with a harmonic, 10. And if we have a look at C2, C2 is four bars, and it's quite complex because there's more, more things changing, more things going on. So it's going to start with the second finger on the 12th fret of the B string, same pattern. Then we change pattern and we move with finger one to the 12th fret of the third string of the G string. And now we're going to go back to our regular pattern right hand one and right hand two using the third string and using the ring finger for the high E string. And even though we're playing the regular pattern, we change melody notes in the middle of the bar. So we have two times fret 12 and two times fret nine. So you'll notice there are two E's next to each other, but they're very different sounding E's. What Philip Harden suggests in the score is to use finger one for fret 12 and then slide down and use finger two for fret nine. The next notes, we're going to take that finger two slide down to fret five and then in the fourth bar we have again two melody notes in the same bar, fret four twice and the open G string twice. So if we were to just play the melody, it might sound something like this. A simple way of thinking about it or we could play it we could play it four times per bar we could play 12 12 9 5 4 0 now what happens with c2 is there's always a crescendo at the end it always builds to the next section and after this after this C section, we go back and play the last repeat of A. We play A again, and we play it louder. This time it's mezzo piano, so it's louder than it's ever been before, and it's kind of building up to the next, the next section that comes after it. So I'll just play through that. Starts with this right hand one and two index and middle, as it was in C1, because we were on the, we we're on the second string. section which is section C. Now in this section C we have again C1 and C2 and there's just one note different in this C1 so I just call it C1 star. It's got a very high note, the highest note in the whole piece in fact. So we have fret 13, fret 12 with finger 1, then fret 15, very high D, and then all the way back to 
fret 10 and we have exactly the same thing that we had before we have the harmonic for the last D of the bar and whenever that bar comes in the piece it's always a little like a little wave there's always a crescendo at the start and a diminuendo so it's like a little little hill like a breath in fact I always think with this piece that having all these melody notes on the off beats in the A section and the C section particularly gives this feeling of like a bird gently flapping its wings and, and kind of floating. So that is C1 star. Very similar to C1 except it's got that high note in the third bar. It's also five bars long. So if we were to do just a summary 13 15, 10 with a harmonic, 10 with a harmonic. And really important to use the index and the middle finger to play those top two strings. For a long time I tried to do it with the index and the ring to keep the fingering consistent between the A section and the C section and it just never worked for me. And I went back to the score because we always go back to the score and we do one of these lessons and often you realize that you've been doing a lot of things totally, totally wrong. And I saw that he had marked in to use the index in the middle. And it really does work. For me, it works much better. So that's C1 star. And then we have C2 just as it was before. So that was the 12th fret starting with the index in the middle pattern. 12th fret on the B string. Then coming to the 12th fret on the G string. With a change. 5th fret. final B section. So, so we've finished with all the A sections, now we land in the final B section. And what's interesting here is again we have two halves. The first half of the B section is actually B2. It's this B that we learnt as the, as the second half of the first. The first time the B came it was B1 and B2 and now it's going to be B2 and B3. Almost like it's picking up where the previous B had left off. So B2, as you may remember, had this chord to start with. And then we had those high moving melody. So we had the E with the ring finger. And then we had the two notes together for the first time in the piece, the B and the F. And then that last bar was the same. Focusing on that A. So. Almost as the as though that was the last melody note in the line. So the second time B comes, it comes as B2, and then we have B3, which is only three bars long. It's quite unique. We're in first position for the first time in the piece. And it starts very similarly. Well, it starts exactly the same as B1 and B2, but then the second half of the bar uses the high E it's almost like it's continuing from where B2 left off. So this is B3. Then the right hand pattern actually changes. We come down. So it's still R1, but we come down to the third and the fourth string. We hold down the A note. And then we hit what looks like a C chord. So we have the high fret one. We have again index, ring index, ring index to facilitate a moving melody part. And then we have what looks like a C chord. And it's a, well, it's a C chord over F because we have this F note in the bass. And again, the right hand position is going to change somewhat. So it starts kind of with a right hand two or right hand one. You can see really both of them together. So you play the outside strings, index, middle, index. And then we lift the hand a little bit and we're going to play the thumb, index, middle, ring on the fifth, fourth, third, and second string, A, D, G, and B string. So we have that. And in this
this part of the part of the piece, this final repeat of B, it seems as though it's really meant to be the climax of the entire piece. It's quite loud and it's it's forte. It's the only part of the piece that's marked forte. And there's a lot of rest strokes. And actually there's a composer's note in there which says even though the rest strokes are going to squish out the ringing strings underneath them, because of course if I have a D string ringing and I play a rest stroke on the G string, I'm going to, I'm going to block that D string, I'm going to mute it. So often in pieces like this, we avoid rest strokes so that all the strings can ring. The composer says, even though that's going to happen, you still need to go for the rest strokes. It's like the climax and we want passion in this part. So this, this whole B section, B2 and B3, the, the second the second time B comes in the piece, we're really going for volume and we are instructed to do the, the rest strokes. They definitely aren't optional. So if I put that final B section together, doing all the rest strokes, we start with B2. And then B3, first position. C chord, C over F, leads us straight into the D section. Now we're getting near to the end and the piece is starting to wind down. So although this section is forte, the D section is subito piano, which means suddenly quiet. So it's like after all this excitement, suddenly things calm down. So the D section I like to think of as D1 and D2, even though they are almost exactly the same notes. There are some slight differences in the way that we play them. So D1 is in first position because we've just come out of that final B. We're in the super loud. We land on that C chord. Then we hold as much of that as possible as we come into the first bar. Second bar, third bar is the same as the first bar. And then we have that run up exactly the same as the bar we have at the end of B1 and B2, but the, f the first six notes are exactly the same. The last two notes are E, and while that E is ringing we go for the C. Then D2 is almost the same except it's in second position, we're not holding down the C, and when we do the run up we have a slight, a slight slowing down, poco rit. So we're not slowing down too much and we don't want to actually slow down at all the first time even though it's quite a challenging bar. It's quite nice not to slow down. So this would be D2. And here we can slow down a little bit. That's probably way too much, <laughs> just a little bit. Then we into E, the ending part. Now E, if you remember, uses bar four and five, which is the same bar, of, C, of the C section, of C1 of the C section, which is when we were up here at the 10th fret, and we were playing the last note as a harmonic. And it plays this exact bar four times in a row. And it's meant to be at speed. There's actually quite a funny performance inst instruction. Quite interesting, I'll, I'll read it to you. A tempo non troppo which doesn't really make sense. It means at speed, but not too much. I mean, <laughs> I've never seen that before because you can't really be, either you're at speed or you're not at speed, but I guess it means that it's still moving, but not, not driving. It's starting to wind down. With a long ending like this, it's very important not to wind down too soon. Otherwise it gets, you know, it gets really, really tiresome. So we want to kind of keep it, keep it moving but definitely not, not be building in energy. So we're up here, we've got finger one on fret 10. We're gonna play this bar. And as always, it's a little wave. It gets louder and quieter. Like a breath. And then we take finger one and we slide it down. 
have just three more bars and in, in these bars we have just one chord per bar and they all have fermatas on them so that we're really slowing down now. What I suggest, at least in the beginning, is that you keep hearing the eighth notes. So you're not just randomly guessing where those chords are. We're still kind of and two and three and four and one and two and three and four and and then you just let that last chord kind of ring out. So if I just take you through those last three chords, it's just a three note chord. It's really the, the notes of the first bar of the whole piece without the D. So it's string six, string three with fret five, fret five on the G string, and then the open E string, thumb index ring. And the chord is rolled, and he asks us to bring out the C, and that's marked piano. Then we kind of slide that back and we go to this chord, which is really all the notes of, of the B section, the first bar of the B section at the same time. And again, it's rolled. There are lots of different ways you can do it. What I, what I like to do to control the volume is have the ring and the middle finger down on the top two strings, play the third string with my index finger and strum the, the low three strings. I just find that gives me a lot of control. So this chord comes twice. It's the same chord in the last two bars. First pianissimo, and then pianississimo, PPP. -p -p. Quietest thing to happen in the piece. Maybe for that we just use the thumb. So if I just run you through those last three bars, I really suggest keeping that rhythm going. So if you think of the first, Think of the first bar, one and two and three and four and we've got and two and three and four and one and two and three and four. And it gives it a kind of a structure as it as it fades out. So that's the whole piece. I hope that was useful. I hope you're able to to play it and enjoy it. It's really a kind of piece that I think you can do whatever you like with. You know, if you take the A section, you just take the notes of the A section. You can make really cool, really cool improvisations. You know, same thing with, with any section, really. It's a, it's a great piece to use as a basis for your own composition or technical exercises. And it's also a great piece to learn note for note and to, and to perform. If you want to learn it note for note, I think the best way to do that is to really master the structure. So to think, to, to learn each section and then get an idea of the architecture of how those, those sections fit together. Thanks so much for watching guys. I hope that was of use to you. If you want to see more guitar videos from us, please do consider subscribing if you haven't already. And don't forget to hit that like if you liked and ring the bell if it's your first time here. And we hope to see you soon. And yeah, thanks for being here. Yeah.